Hello friends, welcome back with our discussion. Today I will start the second module of this course group dynamics that is group process. This module will cover about some process that when a member joins any group and members are working together, they undergo some different kind of process in terms of conflicts, in terms of conformity, in terms of norms, in terms of deviances, in terms of uh, influences, in, in terms of cooperation and competition. So, when members join all together to achieve a common purpose and when interaction takes place every time there are different kind of opinions that every member presents and how people or other members of the group react and respond to those kind of opinions and beliefs then it creates a different kind of environment within the group. That environment is in form of conformity, it is in form of deviances, it is in form of different a feeling of being alienated or being part of the group because there is a misalignment or it can be dis derangement, derangement of group values and goals. It can be in terms of uh, cooperation and competition because when members decide to benefit each and every member or each other then people cooperate and when sometimes member any particular member who uh, decides to earn only individual benefits then there can be a sense of competition among the members as well. So, within this module today I will talk about one process that is conformity. Group conformity. So, when we are talking about conformity, so we will first have to discuss about that on what basis members conform and members conform based on group norms. So, what are those norms? So, norms are something which are spoken and unspoken and accept, uh, implicitly accepted patterns of behavior and rules based on which the group will function. So, they are the certain rules and patterns of behavior which every member is ought to follow and within this at the and, and on the same lines these norms also dictate certain behaviors which are not supposed to be followed by the members of the group. So, group norms are the spoken or unspoken rules that guide how team members or group members interact, collaborate effectively and work efficiently because every member has his own knowledge skills and abilities and following certain norms every member will share those knowledge and abilities to enhance the performances and members can function effectively. So, norms are implicitly agreed upon rules and standards of behavior. Now, when we are talking about these norms it is actually in form of majority that most of the members are agreeing to one certain rule regulation or behavioral aspect of human behavior that everybody is comfortable and they are following that norm. So, that becomes a influence that everybody is following a one rule or one norm and other members or majority of the members are comfortable are agreeing to those norms and that becomes an influence and gradually every member is influenced to follow that norm. So, norm is also a majority of influence in form of prescriptive and proscriptive norm. Now, these are the two types of norms which are either spoken or unspoken, but implicitly agreed, but they have different kind of nature when it comes to defining the rules. So, if we talk about proscriptive norms, these norms refers to the do's and don'ts. For ex a very simple example can be that every employee of the organization is following the dress code right or it can be that every member is following the rules and regulations for example, to report well in time during the office hours. So, this is a proscriptive norm which a person is supposed to follow or supposed to exhibit and the other is prescriptive norms. These are the norms which are often harsher and have dire consequences when not followed. That means, it has certain ramifications in form of punishment as well. For instance, stealing or damaging the property of the organization or for an another example can be that we are not maintaining or employee is or member is not 
maintaining the secrecy of the organization and their mem one of the member is leaking or sharing the information to the competitor organization. Under such circumstances, the member can be severely punished. So, these are the prescriptive norms which are not supposed to be exhibited. Now, these norms are spoken and unspoken, but definitely they are agreed upon patterns of behavior. But the idea is that when a person becomes a member of the group, he has a very strong desire to be considered as part of the group or to become a part of a particular group. Under that circumstances, the person has a desire to fulfill that desire, the person takes a decision that I will conform to the norms of the group. And gradually, when every member is conforming to the norms of the group, that tendency to conform to the norms is termed as group conformity. So, this is one process when we are talking about that how the group functions. So, group conformity can be defined as adjusting one's behavior to align with the norms of the group. As a member of the group, people desire for acceptance by the group and are susceptible to conform the group norms. Definitely, when we want to be accepted by the other members of the group, then we have to form or follow a line of rules. We cannot be, we cannot refrain or derail from that line of group because that can affect an individual's identity and the functioning of the organization. So, this is group conformity. But how the member conform? How people within the group conform. There are certain reasons that why a person want to conform to the group rules. Now, psychologists have identified certain reasons that there, there are certain reasons that why a person conforms to the group norms. The first is jeer pressure. Please make it make a note that here it is jeer, J E E R not peer. Jeer pressure is something a negative sense in a negative sense where person has a fear that if he or she will not follow the rules of the group or norms of the group then he may be he he or she may be ridiculed ridiculed so that is why to under that pressure the uh, uh, the member makes a decision to conform to the group norms the other is social influence now when we have joined a particular group and we are interacting with the group members, then we are sometimes influenced or very much affected by the opinions and belief of the other group members and we try to modify our own values and belief system. Under such circumstances, with the influence of the presence of the other group members, a person tries to conform to the group, mem group members that is if the uh, one person is conforming or behaving in a particular way, we also get influenced by the same. and we conform to the group norm. So, social influence is a process or it is a way when we in the presence of others, we conform to the group norms. The other is compliance that is it is a type of social influence where an individual does not uh, does what someone else wants them to do. It is not something very authoritative, but when we are under high influence of the other person, then automatically we we uh, and the person wants us to behave in a particular manner. So, along with the strong influence, we try to behave or enact any, any decision as per the desire of the other member of the group. So, under such circumstances, when influence is very strong and desire to be part of the group is also very strong, we sometimes t modify our decisions as per the requirement of the other member. So, this is compliance. It is a, a form of influence, social influence, but the situation is different where the other person wants us to behave in a particular way. So, this is compliance and the other is obedience. It is something which is expected by, by the uh, authoritative person or legitimate authority that the other person is supposed to behave in a particular manner. It can be an order, it can be an instruction. So, influenced by the order or the instruction, the person tries to modify his behavior and hence conform to the group norms. So, geo pressure, social influence, compliance and obedience, these are the certain factors which can explain that why a person conforms to the group. This is group conformity, right. The other important reason that why and how a person conforms the very important aspect of this process is intense indoctrination. 
it is a very important point to be noted right now, now is that compliance if I go back to the slide geo pressure social influence compliance and obedience these are the aspects of human behavior which is very much apparent based on interaction also. But when we are talking about intense indoctrination it is actually a process which an individual has to go through if he or she is influenced by an extreme group or any phonetic group who are very much strong uh, which exhibit uh, strength to follow a particular principle of the group and they are so much strong in a sense that they try to influence the other group members in a very unquestioning manner. So, when we talk about intense indoctrination it is a process through which individuals become members of the extreme groups and come to accept the beliefs and norms of a group in a totally unquestioning and highly committed way. They will not ask what, when, what, when and how. It is simply that they have a blind faith on the, on the principles or doctrine or dogmas of those groups and they follow blindly. So, this is intense indoctrination. When any member of, a, of that extreme group is influenced by the dogma or doctrine or principles of that group, then the person do not question also and they start following the group principles in a very pragmatic manner. So, when we are talking about intense doctrination, it is a rigid dogma or doctrine or theory which tend to suppress good sense and good judgment. That means, the, uh, the influence is so high, it is so strong that any person would fail to understand the difference between what is or what is the difference between right and wrong when it comes to the principles of, of a particular extreme group. They are so much influenced. So, these members understanding becomes clouded, the members become confused and they are completely obstructed in their thinking because they are, they are very much dominated by the members of the extreme groups that this is what it is. They show the picture of a particular situation in such a manner that the person tends to believe. So, this is how intense doctrination takes place. So, the understanding becomes dormant that means for a period specific period of time the members become highly influenced in a way that the understanding is missing that means understanding, understanding of a person or judgment is completely confused and the person becomes very much controlled and dominated by the members of that extreme group. So, in a highly indoctrinated group people become like automans, automatons that means they become like robots that wherever you will move them or in any direction they will move accordingly. They will not question the authorities in the group that what, when and how or what can be the impact of particular type of group that uh, uh, behavior that they are being expected to exhibit. So, they become completely controlled, their minds are completely controlled, their thought process is completely controlled by the other members of the group. They become mechanical in nature that whatever is being instructed to them, the members do perform. They spout and parrot doctrine or dogma, whatever is being feeded in their mind, they tend to speak the same thing. So, they, they cram up the rules, they cram up the norms, they cram up all the principles what the members follow and they speak the same in their own in through their actions and their decisions. So, under such type of circumstances group norms become indoctrinated and the members are expected to accept as true without questioning instead of speaking with common sense or understanding the thinking becomes stymied and suppressed. Even if any person who asks any logical question also cross questions the other members they are being suppressed in a very tactful manner. So, this is intense doctrination which is an example of group conformity. Now, the next question is that what are the reasons that why a person becomes so highly indoctrinated? There are certain reasons that why a person becomes in indoctrinated. The first is decreased attentional capacity. Maybe because of certain circumstances, the members tend to lose the understanding of the functioning of the group. They try, they become derailed based on their understanding. They refrain from understanding the difference between what is right and what is wrong and based on that they tend to reduce or lose hold on their cognitive capacities. That is cognitive capacity here means that power or power to interpret 
the situation, interpret the environment and give meaningful interpretation to the whole situation. So, when the cognitive capacity of the individual is reduced, that means the extreme groups become so dominated that in a very tactful manner, they tend to modify the thought process, they change, they alter the, uh, the thought process of the, of the members in a very systematic manner and as such the person loses hold on his cognitive attention capacity. And under circle circumstances, the person tend to accept what the other people is, ex is expecting from him or her. So, the first reason that what causes intense indoctrination is decreased attentional capacity. The other is by keeping recruits, new recruits fatigued. Here a situation has been created in a way that the members or any new member of the group is being kept starved or away from the normal life of a person. For example, they are being kept hungry for a long period of time, they are being kept away from the no normal world away from the normal world for a longer period of time, there is no, uh, there is no environment where a person can sleep properly and they are away from their family. Now, under such negative circumstances, a member becomes weak, he becomes starved, he becomes weak and they are emotionally aroused because when a person, a new member who is away from the family, he is emotionally aroused. Now, the, the, mem the group members try to cash on these kind of deformities and the person decides, the new member decides to, to follow the rules so that he or she has a chance to meet his family or to, to receive any appropriate environment where the survival is possible. So, by keeping new recruits fatigued, the members are subjected to deprivation of food, sleep, family and so on which make them emotionally aroused and isolated. When people are confused, they are uncertain about how to act and experience such reduced confidence, then they have a develop, then they develop the tendency to conform and it that kind of indoctrination is enhanced. The next is inducing the results to make public statements. Once the members, a member becomes the part of the group, a very influential member becomes the part of the group or he has, he or she has some authority within the group, then the person tries to influence the other members in a way that they are being compelled to speak on behalf of that extreme group. They are compelled to propagate the principles, the opinions and ideas of that extreme group to the public forum. So, this is inducing the recruits to make public statements. They are being compelled, they are being pushed to the public world, a uh, public forum where they are their duty is basically to speak up what the group has established for themselves. So, they are subjected to make public statements using intense peer pressure supporting groups views. They are applied to, to potential members and are compelled continually over time until recruits reach a position where they accept the group views in totally unquestioning manner. Even if the person knows that something is wrong, still the person does not have the capacity and potential to question the other members. They are so much heavily and strongly influenced by the other group members of the extreme groups. Now, the next is that how this process of intense indoctrination takes place. It is not that the members recruit one member and the person is indoctrinated, no. Actually, the person again has to undergo this kind of conformity process when intense doctrination is taking place in form of group conformity. So, again there are four steps, four stages when this process of intense indoctrination takes place. The first is softening up, that means when a new member is being recruited in, a, in the group, they are isolated from friends, so they are away from their social life, they are away from the family. So, at one time they are being kept deprived and at the other end they are being given some kind of social and moral support to that isolated person just to give him an idea that you are not alone, we are with you. And in that circumstances the person becomes comfortable that, that at least some kind of comfort, comfort environment is there. So, under sit, first step of soft, softening up, the new members or the recruits are isolated from friends and families and efforts are made to keep them confused, disoriented and emotionally aroused. 
the other is compliance. Now, under this stage what happens that the recruits are asked to actively involve themselves in the belief and demands of the role as the member. Once the member is in, is in the group itself, then certain roles are being assigned to the members and the duties. As soon as the role and duties are assigned to one particular member, the expectation bar is being raised. As soon as the expectation bar is being raised, the members try to mold themselves, tries to develop new skills and abilities or other tasks so that he should, he, is, he should not be asked to leave the group and the person tries to comply with the group norms. See, the, the idea is that influence is so heavy and strong that the person immediately tries to comply. The other is internalization that means that agreeing to the views of the group members and imbibing all the principles of the group that leads to intense indoctrination. The recruits begin to agree the views of the group as accurate and in reality accept it as true without questioning that if it can be wrong also, but still they will internalize, they will imbibe all the rules, all the principles of the group membership. And the last is consolidation. Now, this is the merging stage where recruit adds strength to make their member by engaging in costly acts that make it difficult to go back to the original life. Once the person becomes a member of the group in terms of role, in terms of membership, in terms of principles, in terms of dogma or doctrines, the person is so much influenced by the, by the principles of the group that the person is ready to, to take any risk in order to maintain the principles of the extreme groups. Under such circumstances, the person can also enact any risky decision as well. And the person has complete awareness that even if he decides not to enact and he cannot go back to his normal life, the person becomes entangled to this extreme group. So, this is consolidation where internalization is there, compliance is there. The uh, emotionally aroused person is being given a comfortable environment and when all these factors are being consolidated, the person is completely immersed in the group principle. So, this is consolidation where the person continues till his last breath as he is unable to undo about what he has confirmed to the group norm. So, this is the process of intense indoctrination. So, since we are uh, talking about group conformity and we have discussed about different aspects uh, to, to refer to conformity from the psychology point of view. Let us continue with our discussion based on the classic experiment given by Solomon Ash. He has conducted, uh, he conducted an experiment to investigate the extent to which social pressure from a, a majority group could affect a person to confirm. That means, how social pressure play a very important role to compel a person to conform to certain norms. So, Ash, Solomon Ash in the 1951 designed an experiment which was later known as the classic experiment in social psychology, where there was an obvious answer to a line judgment task. He assigned a very simple task to understand and identify that which, which particular line matches the other among the other three proposed lines. So, this was a very simple task that was assigned to the subjects to identify that which line matches among the three lines and that will define an individual's extent to conform to the group members answer. So, Ash studied, conducted a visual perception test and where the participants task was to decide which of the bars on the card 2 that is the right hand card 2 which has three, 3 lines A, B, C and among these 3 lines which line matches the line which has been identified or presented on card 1 that, that is the target line. And as we can easily understand when we are seeing this diagram that the task is simple and the correct answer is also obvious. Everybody knows it that how and in what manner target line on card 1 matches among the 3 lines which are presented on card 2. Now, 
the significance essence of this experiment is that although, although the participant were assigned a very simple task to match the light, but this was conducted in a very elaborative manner and it was conducted on certain groups of people and based on several trials. So, in each experiment there was a naive participant, although there were some other members also in the group, but one member was the naive and the other members were known as the confederates who were instructed to answer the question in a particular manner. manner. That means, to uh, participate in the vision test and how they have to perform. That means, the confederates were knowing that what they are doing and the naive was given an impression that the other members are also the members who are participating in the test. So, in the, in the test itself the subjects were informed that they are taking part in a vision test and around 5 to 8 groups were formed with a total of 50 students who were part of ASH experimental condition. That means, confederates were knowing that what they are being they are doing and what they are being instructed to do so in the test. So, the confederates were told that they have to respond to the line task which is presented and the naive pre, pre participant however, had no inkling that the other students were not participants. And after the ta line task was performed or presented each student verbally announced which line that is 1, 2 or 3 matched the target line, which we have already discussed about the objective of the task. Right? Now, in this experiment since uh, 5 or 8 groups were assigned with every group having naive experiment, now the uh, experiment was, uh, con uh, was conducted based on some trials, maybe 18 trials were conducted and out of which 12 trials were the critical trials. Why? Because the purpose of this trial was to see if the participants that is the naive participant in every group would change their answer in order to confirm to the others in the group responded. Now, the, the basic thing is that even in these critical trials the confederates were instructed to give the wrong response. Although the confederates were also knowing that what is the right answer, but they were instructed to give the wrong response and to what extent every naive participant in the group, they were found that they were conforming to the wrong answer. So, these were the critical trials. Now, during the first part of the procedure, the confederates answered the questions correctly. Initially, they were instructed to give correct answer and later on come on to uh, give the wrong responses. However, eventually began when the experiment began providing incorrect answers based on how they had been instructed by the, exp by the experimenters. So, each person in the room had to state aloud in that which comparison line A, B or C was most like the target line and the answer was always obvious. So, the real participant sat at the end of the row and gave his or her answer in the last. Why? Because the objective was that the naive participant in every group has to understand that which confederate has given which answer so that he can answer accordingly. Now, at the same time there was another control situation. This was the situation which comprised of the critical trials. The other condition was the control condition. Now, in this condition there were 37 participants and in order to ensure that the average person could actively and accurately gauge the length of the lines, the control group was asked to individually write down the response to down the correct match. That means, they were not asked to respond or state aloud, but they were asked to respond or give their responses in writing. And according to these results, participants were very ac accurate in the line judgments choosing the correct answer 99 percent of the time. So, that means, when in the critical trials, when the confederates were giving their responses while speaking or stating aloud, then the naive participants were influenced in a different manner and when in the control condition when the participants were asked to write their responses, then 
the state of conformity was different and most of the time 99 percent of the times the response was correct. So, what was the result of that experiment which was performed by the ash? So, it was found that nearly 75 percent of the conformity experiments went along with the rest of the group at least one time. That means, 75 percent of the time mem the naive participant conformed to the response of the of the confederates. That means, if they were responding wrong, they also conformed to the wrong response that which line is matching with the target line. Although it was the correct, correct answer was known to the naive participant also, but that, uh, that naive participant conformed to the wrong answer of the confederates. It was also found that after combining all the trials, the results indicated that participants conformed to the incorrect group answer approximately one third of the time. That means, in every trial and in every group, it was one third of the time that the naive participant conformed to the wrong response. And after and the experiments also looked at the effect that the number of people present in the group had on conformity. That means, size of the group also played a very important role in the process of conformity. That means, if there was only one confederate, just con confederate was present, there was virtually no impact on participants answer. But with the presence of two confederates had only a tiny effect. That means, if one confederate was there, then the, resp uh, the response of the naive participant was not affected. Then again, if two or more participants were there as the confederates, then there was a little effect of conformity on the naive participant. And the level of conformity seen with three or more conf confederate was far more significant. That means, as the group size was increasing gradually, that means the number of confederates were increasing in the group, the level of conformity was also going high for the naive participants. It was also found by Ash that having one of the confederates give the correct answer while the rest of the confederates gave the incorrect answer dramatically lowered conformity. That means, as soon as the naive participant received some support to his correct answer even by one single confederate, his conformity level goes, goes down because a one confederate, even one confederate who is giving the right response, he could get that support for the right response and he decided not to conform in one particular trial. So, in this situation just 5 to 10 percent of the participants conformed to the rest of the group depending on how often the alley answered correctly. Later studies have also supported this finding suggesting that having social support is an important tool in, com in combating conformity. Even in the group, if one person conforms to the right answer, the support is being solicited by the naive participant. So, we can say that people conform based on certain notions and when these the naive participants were interviewed that what was the reason of the conformity to the wrong answer, it was it was it was answered, it was interviewed, it was a response of all the naive participants that they confirmed with the wrong re response just to get along with the group and they should not appear as peculiar, peculiar by the other members of the group. So, just out of embarrassment and to fit into the group, the naive participant part confirmed to the wrong response. A few of them said that they really did not believe the group answers were correct. That means, then they were not sure or confident about their responses. They decided to confirm to the response of the confederates even knowing also that the answer was correct, but still they confirmed because they were not sure of their information, complete information is correct or incorrect. So, based on the ASH experiment, people confirm because of two reasons, the normative reason or the normative influence that because they want to fit into the group. As a norm to continue the membership of the group, people tend to conform to the group norms. No matter how much they are influenced or no matter to what extent they are being affected by the group norms, but to continue the membership of the group or to be considered as part of the group, members tend to conform to the norms of the group that is the normative influence and the other is informational influence that is because they believe the group is better informed than they are. When they were 
when they were not knowing that to what extent the confederates responses are whether their responses are correct or not, but knowing that their information is incomplete or incorrect they actually conformed to the information given by the group members. So, this was the Solomon Ash classic experiment which was completely based on one task of line judgment and how with the gradual uh, exposure of this experiment to the uh, to the academy and other world social world how this experiment became became a classic experiment where the process of conformity can be understood and majority influence is a major reason or social pressure is a major reason that why people conform. So, based on that we can continue that what are these two influences in detail. The normative influence it is where a person confirms to fit in with the group because they do not want to appear foolish or peculiar or ridiculous. So, just to avoid that kind of social embarrassment people tend to influence. Normative influence is usually associated with compliance where a person changes their public behavior, but not their personal beliefs. For example, any person who is in a social group would not prefer to smoke, but just because of being feel accepted by the other group members, the person will indulge in smoking, although he does not smoke or does not prefer smoking. So, this is normative influence just to continue the membership of the group, the person is influenced by the group members thought process. And the other is informational influence, this refers to new information or arguments provided by the group members and the member tend to change their attitudes, beliefs and ideas based on the new information they have received. So, informational influence is likely stronger when a person is uncertain or not confident about the correct interpretation and it is their decision to confirm to what information they have received from the group members. They consider that information as a guidance for themselves and then confirm. So, normative and informational influence are the two factors that play a major role in the process of conformity. Next comes factors affecting conformity. Based on the experiment, if we recollect that even one member conforms to the correct answer or one confederate confirms for the correct answer, then the knife participant also confirms for the correct answer. So, group size plays a major role. So, the bigger the majority group of confederates, the more people conform, but only up to a certain point. That means, that there is a limit to conform by the person, even though confederates were responding to the wrong, wrong uh, they are giving the wrong answer and the naive participant is also continuously conforming to the wrong response. But actually there will be a point when the naive participant will stop conforming. So, this is the influence of group size on the process of conformity because there will be a point when the mem when the naive participant will also ascertain that what can be the consequence of conforming to the wrong response within the group itself lack of unanimity or presence of an ally. That means, the absence of group unanimity lowers overall conformity as participants feel less need for social approval of the group. That means, if there is some division of cohesion among group members or the members are not cohesive enough that they will conform to only one decision of the group, then under such circumstances the person can avoid to conform to the decision of the group and rather they will go by with the group decision to which they want to conform. So, this is the lack of group unanimity that means, the more the group is diverse or less cohesive, then there are less chances that the person will conform to the group norms. Difficulty of the task, the more the task is difficult, it becomes difficult for the person to perform it in a very effective manner. Just to have complete knowledge to perform the, that difficult task, the person tries to conform to the group members that how they are performing and they depend on the information given by the other members. So, when comparing the lines A, B and C were made more similar in length, it was harder to judge the correct answer and conformity increased. Now, if I go to the experiment here, the difference is very much clear that how target line 
is matching with the other line in card 2. But if the all the three lines are very much made similar in size in length, then it is very difficult to identify the similarity that is difficult to match the line in card 2. So, the more the, the task becomes difficult, the more the person tries to confirm. So, we are uncertain and it seems we look to others for confirmation. The more difficult the task, the greater the conformity. And the other is answer in private. That means, when we are answering in private, then there is less pressure in the environment. Less social pressure is experienced by the member and they are more open to voice their, their opinion or decision. So, when we are answering in privacy or more privacy is maintained in group situation, then the conformity decreases. This is because there are fewer group pressures and normative influence is not as powerful as there is no fear of rejection from the group. So, again in the experiment itself, in the control situation, when the responses were collected on in written form, then the conformity reduced. Similarly, because privacy has been maintained, people do not fear rejection and they tend to be more confident and more certain in their responses. So, this is how conformity has been defined based on group norms that why people conform. So, based on their decision making, based on their desire to continue as a membership of the group, people tend to confirm. So, that is how conformity takes place. Next, I will start with another topic of group process that is group deviance. As the term implies, it is thought of as a behavior that violates the shared norms of the group. When members tend to deviate, tend to disagree with the group norms, rules, regulations, then members sometimes tend to deviate or they become estranged to the established norms of the group or when the members do not or fail to align with the group norms, then this tends, tendency evolves which is termed as group deviance. So, it is perceived when members are not convinced with the group norms or there is no that our the groups are uh, the norms are not effective for the group goals and there is a conflict between the individual and the group goals. So, whenever there is a conflict there is misalignment or there is a preconceived uh, notion about group norms then the group deviance occurs. It also occurs when the members do not have the complete knowledge of a particular norm or norms and unconsciously violate the group norms and they tend to understand the value of group norms only when they receive feedback from the other members of the group. So, it is a tendency that can be only reduced when people tend to interact with the other members of the group and then learn to conform to the norms so as to achieve the goal or the norms become more effective in or influential in influencing the group behavior. So, when we are talking about group deviance, then this is experienced or observed in two forms, either it is anomie or the other is alienation. So, deviance leads to anomie which is also a feeling of being normlessness or an individual's departure from the group values. This term was first of all uh, coined or propounded by Emily Durkheim and it arises from a mismatch between personal group standards and wider social standards. These, this kind of deviance in form of enemy, uh, enemy is basically observed due to moral deregulation or there is a breakdown or dearrangement of social norms values. And to curb the tendency of enemy, sharing of values should be encouraged to curb egoistic drives and maintain group stability. This means sometimes group members witness any moral deregulation or unethical behavior within the organization that uh, forces a person to not to align with the group norms as they are not as per their moral definitions or ethical definitions and the person tend to feel that he or she is completely normless in that particular group. So, it is a feeling of being normless and it is termed as anomy in form of deviance. The other form of deviance is also experienced in form of alienation. It is a distance between a member and the group. It is described as lacking sense of belongingness or not being part of a group. 
that means there is no emotional attachment between the group and a particular member and there is a cut off between group values, standards and goals. So, one of the earliest propounder of this term is Karl Marx and emphasized that alienation leads to decline in initiative and freedom. When there is no emotional connect with the other members of the group, then definitely there is reduced interactions between members and the group and definitely there is lack of taking in lack of feeling of taking initiative or taking freedom in taking any decision decision or decision making process. So, it is the individual estrangement from traditional community or a group and leads to difficulty in adapting to each other's uniqueness. So, whenever the person fails to create that kind of relationship with the members to an extent when the person can actually match with his group standards with his own standards and the group standards then this kind of feeling is natural to evolve that is alienation. So, deviance is a tendency that either the person is unable to understand the value of the group norms of any particular organization, the person tends to break down those norms, the person is not convinced or the person witnesses some kind of mismatching between his own standards and the organizational standards and experience or feeling of being normless or there is a complete disconnect between a member and the group in form of anomy and alienation. Since we are talking about deviance, then this type of deviance can also be experienced in organizations in form of workplace deviant behaviors. When an individual exhibits antisocial actions by organizational members which are intentional and the person intentionally violate the established rules and regulations and it has negative consequences on the productivity and efficiency of the organization as well as the other group members. So, workplace deviant behaviors are antisocial actions when behaviors and when behaviors surface in form of some destructive patterns of behaviors and influence employee participation, motivation, cooperation and commitment and this in some turn leads to reduced employee productivity, job satisfaction and increased turnover. So, we workplace deviant behaviors are antisocial behaviors and actions which aim actually to intentionally destroy organizational properties, organizational norms, policies which have negative impact on the overall performance of the organization. So, workplace deviant behaviors are further can be experienced in form of two are experienced in two forms. The first is constructive organizational deviance and the other is destructive organizational deviance. So, when we talk about deviance definitely any any individual would relate it literally to some destructive patterns of behaviors, but at the same time this term also have some positive connotations. So, if we talk about constructive organizational deviance, such kind of deviance is defined as voluntary behaviors that violate significant organizational norms and in doing so contributes to the well being of an organization and its members or both. So, there are certain norms which go against the well being of the employees and the organization and any employee or individual will take an initiative to break down those norms, organizational norms, so that it ha do not have any negative impact in future. So, this is termed as constructive organizational deviance such as whistle blowing. Whistle blowing is termed as constructive organizational deviance where any member would expose some any malpractice which is occurring in the organization cycle and it is being exposed to the media or to the higher authorities that what kind of malpractices are being practiced within the organization and how it is harming the organization. These malpractice can be in terms of hiring malpractices, it can be also in terms of financial malpractices or any fraudulent financial fraudulent practices that can lead any organization to a state of bankruptcy. There can there are number of cases where we can talk about workplace deviant be behaviors or constructive deviance behaviors. For example, Edward Snowden, he was an employee in national security agency in US and how he exposed to the media that how NSA is tapping and tracing and tracking the information on other internet websites and how they are impacting the other the economy of the nation in different forms. The other kind of example can be of Sharon Watkins who 
exposed financial fraudulent activities to the founder of the Enron company and later on uh, till the information was exposed to the founder of the Enron, an, a massive loss has taken place in the organization and the, uh, and the company had to look for protection against bankruptcy. So, such kind of behaviors are termed as constructive deviant behaviors in terms of whistleblowing when any person can expose any organization or any employee who is engaged in different kind of malpractices. Another, another example can be of Vijay Pandhare case in India where he exposed the irrigation ministry in Maharashtra that how some financial fraudulent practices were being executed in the irrigation projects and when these practices and employees were exposed. So, it was such a loss to the state that at that time the deputy chief minister Ajit Pawar had to resign while for being the chief minister of Maharashtra. So, these kind of behaviors which are intended to benefit the organization while breaking down the organizational norms are termed as constructive organizational deviance. Another example can be of Shanmugam Manjunath, a case in Uttar Pradesh where he exposed some financial and unethical uh, practices which were found at the Indian Oil Corporation when after being exposed he was killed on the road by some other uh, some other people for they were being exposed to the to the higher authorities. So, these kind of examples simply reflect that how people tend to expose fraudulent activities which are occurring in the organization and how after exposing these activities the organization benefits from such kind of behaviors. So, these are constructive organizational deviance and the other is destructive organizational deviance. This refers to deviance or uh, voluntary behaviors that violate significant no organizational norms and in doing so threaten the well-being of the organization and the members or both. Under such ki kind of deviances, employees or organization tend to only think about their own personal interest and they try to hamper or uh, hamper or disintegrate with the organizational norms for their own personal interest. Whereas, in constructive deviance, the, the intention is to benefit the organization and the members. Some uh, examples of uh, destructive deviances are cyber loafing that means unintentional uh, sorry employees intentional use of technology for their own personal use such as surfing websites which are not related to their work, sending personal emails, online gaming or social network. Such kind of uh, practices are definitely considered to be unethical at workplaces, but at the same time when exceeds the limit it is termed as cyber loafing. The other is workplace aggression. This includes a wide range of behaviors ranging from verbal acts such as being abusive to the other person or insulting or spreading rumors about the, about the other person to physical attacks such as punching or slapping. The other kind of uh, workplace deviant behavior is workplace bullying. Uh, it is a pattern of mistreatment from others and an employee receives. It can be a junior employee or any senior authority who ill treats their colleagues or their co-workers and they tend to harass and humiliate the employees where in terms of verbal harassment or non-verbal harassment, it can be physical abuse or it can be a psychological torture. So, some examples of <coughs> uh, workplace deviant behaviors can be constant critic, it in an action of continuously criticizing any employee or disapproving any employee for any any action or decision he has taken. It can be in the form of gatekeeper when an employee deliberately target to keep the person out of the communication loop or give him impartial or incomplete information regarding any task. So, such type of bullying is been very much in practice at workplaces which lead to workplace deviant behaviors or it can be screaming mimi when any employee who shouts at the employee intimidate the employee or slam things or throws objects at the employee with no reason while venting their frustration onto the other person. These are the kind of bully behavior that any employee can experience and has ne negative consequences on the productivity and efficiency of the organization and that of the employee. And the last is employee theft using the company's properties and resources for personal use. So, these kind of 
uh, deviant behaviors are definitely not in favor of the well being of the employees and the organization, rather, it has negative consequences on the organization. If workplace deviance has some negative effects, then there is another aspect of group process that is group cohesiveness. This is the strength of an individual's desire to be re to remain as part of the group and the members tend to participate and conform to the group norms in a very stringent manner. There can be a tendency that whenever any employee who is very much satisfied with the organization, satisfied with the group process, satisfied with other resources, he or she can achieve or avail regarding knowledge, skills and abilities, then the person generally develops a tendency to remain as part of the group. This tendency, if the strength is very high, then the person becomes highly cohesive to that group. So, this is this is another process of uh, proce process of group that can be experienced in terms of group cohesiveness. And when we are talking about group cohesiveness, there can be several reasons that why a person has a has a very intense desire to be associated with the group. It can be attraction for example, any group which is very successful based on performance and effectiveness, then the person has has strong desire to be to be remain to remain as part of the group and hence become highly cohesive. The other can be group success, if the if the performance of the group is very much impactful or influential or it has wider a uh, wider recognition at, at social or, or any market level, then definitely the person or the member has higher desire to remain as part of the group and becomes highly cohesive to that group. The other is group size. The smaller the group, the more the person becomes connected to each other, there, there is more close or intimate personal relationships, interpersonal relationships with the other members. People understand the dynamics of the interaction very well and tend to remain to remain as part of the group itself. And the other is external threats and dangers. If any member is very much protected by the external threats and dangers or from the other insecurities, then definitely the person has higher desire to be part of that group. And based on these tendencies, the person tends to develop higher cohesion in the, for that group. So, group cohesiveness depends on attraction group success, group size and external threats and dangers. So, it is an individual's desire, the intensity of the desire to what extent he or she wants to remain as part of the group. So, to understand further about the concept of group cohesiveness. So, there is a very famous and classic study of cohesiveness based on Shaster. He was a social psychologist and he propounded a pitchfork productivity curves to understand the impact of cohesiveness on productivity. So, based on this diagram, a graphical diagram, there are two major elements of this study, the productivity and induction in form of influence or leadership. So, in this study, what he performed was that in terms of pitchfork study, that he, he experienced the group performances based on cohesiveness. He measured the level of cohesiveness in high and low cohesive cohesion and at the same time, he has maintained that if induction is substituted with, with leadership, appropriate leadership style, then what can be the impact of cohesion, cohesiveness and induction on productivity. So, it was found that if a group is highly cohesive and there is positive leadership, then definitely the productivity will be very high, which is the obvious outcome of this kind of combination that is high cohesion plus induction. This will lead to high productivity levels. Whereas, if the cohesiveness of any group is low and the leadership style is positive, that means appropriate leadership style is implemented on such type of group, then leader can manage or train uh, the group members to how to become cohesive about that group and then raise the level of productivity. On the other hand, if the cohesion is low and the leadership style is also very low or negative where leadership is not very much effective or influential to increase the le level of cohesion, then again the level of productivity will also go low, which is again a very negative situation which can have negative consequence on the performance of the organization. 
whereas if the cohesiveness is very high and the and the induction in terms of leadership is negative then again the leadership can have negative impact on such highly cohesive groups and under such circumstances if the group members are are highly cohesive and they have intense desire to remain intact or remain as part of the group then these these members of highly cohesive uh, groups can actually become or transform into self management groups where they will enhance their decision making abilities so as to increase the productivity so based on this kind of analysis by shaster it was found that if cohesiveness is low and induction in terms of leadership is high then definitely the productivity will go high which is an appropriate situation to maintain that balance otherwise the group or highly cohesive groups can become self management teams in order to take appropriate decisions and enhance productivity and performance of the organization so this is how the level of cohesion in terms of high and low based on leadership influence or leadership or influence in term of induction can have a very deep impact on the performance and effectiveness of the organization so according to shaster's classic study of cohesion cohesiveness high cohesion 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 and positive leadership will lead to high productivity low cohesiveness and positive leadership style will definitely make will definitely require an effort to raise the level of cohesion among members and have positive impact on the organization if the cohesiveness is low and induction is also negative then again it creates a negative cycle and the productivity will go low and if cohesion is high and induction is low then again members itself take their own decisions decision making processes indulge in different kind of organizational process to enhance their performance while transforming themselves into self management teams <clears throat> so this is how cohesiveness can be explained at organizational level based on productivity and induction so what are the consequences of group cohesiveness definitely the most natural cons positive consequence of group cohesiveness is high performance member satisfaction emotional adjustment because members are very close to each other they have intimate personal relationships with each other that help them to share their grievances and satisfy their sense of belongingness there is intra group competition also which is something which is a negative side of the consequence of high group cohesiveness because whenever the group size increases and the cohesion also increases then there are chances that there is there uh, there are chances of intra group a uh, competition where members form cliques as we have already dis discussed this term and members tend to have their own subgroups which affect the uh, the effectiveness of the organization on an overall basis if the group size is small and there is cohesion then definitely there is there is devoid of intra group competition but as the group size increases and cohesion also increases then definitely it has a some negative consequence on the other hand in terms of intra group competition at the other hand <coughs> there are also some uh, conformity pressures in terms of group think it is another kind of tendency that evolves if there is intra group competition that at the same time the negative impact can also be observed in form of group thing it is a tendency of members of highly cohesive groups to strongly conform to the to the group decisions that they fail to think critically or reject the potential influences of outsiders or some negative elements within the group itself that means there is an absence of testing reality and moral judgment the members tend to be so cohesive cohesive uh, within the group that they fail to think that whatever decision they have been taken what kind of impact it will have in future the no doubt the trust is very high but at the same time they tend to fail to understand the details of the decision making process and everything is is being taken for granted in form of that whatever decision has been taken it will have a negative it will have a positive impact only but sometimes under such kind of conformity pressures the decision making also goes wrong because there is no reality testing or moral judgment people have people tend to have uh, have high expectations from each other while being highly 
cohesive and under such circumstances extreme risk, uh, risk is being taken, extreme decisions are being taken without understanding the impact of the decision on the organization. So, this is the negative impact of group cohesiveness that is group think or intergroup competition. At the same time, the positive consequence can be in form of high performance and member satisfaction and emotional adjustment. The another kind of consequence of group cohesiveness can be in form of social loafing and social facilitation. So, these, these kind of tendencies evolve when the group is highly cohesive and at the same time when members are present within the group, then the presence of others also influences the performance of the other members of the group. So, when we talk about social loafing, so it is a tendency that group members exert less individual effort on an additive task as the size of the group increases. So, as the size of the group increases, no doubt there is intergroup competition. At the same time, when the group size increases and the cohesion goes high, then members tend to put less additive efforts on the additional tasks and they tend to shrug off from their responsibility. So, this kind of tendency is termed as social loafing. That means, shrugging from, your, from one's own responsibility, passing on or transferring on to the other members and then making less efforts in decision making or performing. So, this is social loafing and the other is social facilitation. It is a tendency for the presence of others sometimes to enhance an individual performance and at other times to impair it. For instance, when the group size increases and the cohesion also increases, there is a tendency of intergroup competition while forming clips, cliques. Once cliques are being formed, then people tend to pull each other down sometimes because of internal comp competitiveness. Under such circumstances, whenever an individual is able to perform a task, either the presence of the others will enhance his performance or maybe the performance will be impaired by the presence of the others. It can be understood in a form that whenever a person is performing, uh, giving a guitar performance on the stage, some members of the same class or batch, some members presence will actually motivate or enhance the, the individual's performance on the stage and at the same time of the same in of the same batch only some members will try to, inf to influence the performer in a way that his performance will go down. So, this is social facilitation that to what extent the presence of the other person is actually impairing or enhancing his or her performance. So, this is social facilitation. So, these are the positive and negative consequences of group cohesiveness in terms of positive in consequences that is high performance, member satisfaction and emotional adjustment and the negative consequence can be in form of group think or social loafing and social facilitation. So, these are the consequences of highly cohesive, cohesive group. But how to understand that whether this tendency of group thing ha is existing in any group or not. For this certain kind of behavioral symptoms are being studied by social psychologists that, that reflects that the tendency of group thing exists in any group. It can be in form of illusion of invulnerability. It creates excessive optimism that encourages members to take extreme risk and decisions. Whenever the whenever the group members are highly cohesive, they are overconfident about the group decision making process and they are on the verge of taking extreme risk which can have negative influence or impact on the organizational performance. So, this kind of tendency of having excessive optimism about the other members and decision making process is known as illusion of ill vulnerability. It is an illusion as the term imply, implies having a wrong impression about own group performances. The other is belief in inherent morality. Members have strong belief in the rightness of the decisions and sometimes ignore the moral and ethical consequences of their decisions. That the decision that has been taken is considered to be the right one irrespective whether ethicalities has been considered or morality has been considered or not to implement any particular decision. This is belief in inher belief in inherent morality. Maybe overtly they consider themselves to be highly moral, but maybe insidious the decision making can, can be taken while going to any extent. The other is self-censorship. 
members are under constant pressures not to express arguments, doubts and deviations against the group decision or views. It is a kind of extent of extreme conformity that even the member knows, one particular member knows that the decision will have a wrong impact in future or any decision is full of errors. Due to conformity pressures, the person tends to keep him or herself mum for not to express disagreement regarding a particular decision. This is self-censorship. The other is self-appointed mind guards. Members protect the group and the leader from information that is problematic or contradictory to the group's cohesiveness. Sometimes um, one particular member would act as a mind guard to protect the decision of the organization. In spite of knowing the reality, in spite of knowing the consequence, member would prefer not to interrupt in the decision making process and because the member is highly cohesive and at the same time the decision that has been taken or any disagreement that can be expressed can hamper the decision making process because more problems can be created if any disagreement has been expressed during the process. So, this is self appointed mind guards. It is an individual decision that I should not express any kind of disagreement because if I will express then there can be some kind of problem that can arise during decision making process. And the last is stereotype views of out group. Negative views make effective responses to conflict which seems unnecessary. While being highly cohesive, members tend to have extreme negative opinions and viewpoints about the external groups that impact their effective responses. Sometimes people tend to hear something negative about the external groups or they speak extremely negative about the other groups which actually only hampers their own effective responses to the conflict that is already occurring with those groups which seems unnecessary without understanding the external groups and bringing the conflict or extending the conflict to the extent that the responses become very ineffective because the conflict is, is expanding, it is extending rather to reduce. So, these are the symptoms of group think and when people tend to or they are being pressurized to think and act on one particular line. Next is remedies for group thing. Now, since these remedies have some negative consequence also, then social psychologists have also talked about two techniques to rectify the tendency of group thing. The first is devil's advocate technique. This is a technique in which the member of the group itself is allowed to be critical to the decision making process of the group members. The member in itself is appointed as a critic to assess, analyze critically about the decision that, that has been taken by the group members and prevent the tendency of group thing and increase the quality of the decision making process. It also helps prevent companies from making expensive or hasty decisions, promotes open inquiry and admit the shortcomings. In in nutshell, it can be stated if I go back to the slide that the tendency of self-censorship and self-appointed mind guards can be reduced based on devil's advocate technique. And the other is authentic dissent technique. This is a technique for improving the quality of group decision in which one outside expert actively disagree with the group's in initial preferences or decisions and encourages original thinking and alternative view and attitude changes. Now, this kind of technique is very much relevant to curb the tendency of illusion of invulnerability, belief in inherent morality and stereotype views of out group. Why? Because when we are talking about authentic descent technique, the third party or the external member who is not the member of the group definitely will compel or modulate or regulate the behavior of the group members where attitude change is also existing and at the same time the person is encouraging members to come up with their original thinking based on reality and morality. So, these are the remedies for group thing. So, I conclude with this discussion. We will start with the new unit next class. Thank you so much.